Welcome ladies and gentlemen. So what I'd like to do is show you how to graph exponential equations, I'm sorry, when they're in the form of y equals a times log base b to x, as well as y equals a times ln of x. And basically these are going to have you know, some very small trans, uh, well there's actually not going to be any, the only transformations we're going to have is reflections, but I kind of want to talk a little bit as far as um, the bases of the logarithm graph as well as what the general parent graph looks like because a lot of students get confused, um, especially once we start throwing in numbers in different places. Even though they're not translations, we're not shifting the graph left to right, up or down, they are going to have some effects. Now, I don't have any graph paper. I am just doing a general um, idea of what the graph is, just using the basic transformations. Um, so if you want to kind of see how you know, a graph changes, for instance, if it's log base 2 or if it's log base 4, um, that is going to affect the graph, but I'm just not going to get into it. So I'd use, I would just recommend getting into the graphing technology you can see. But what I'm going to be dealing with is the points on the graph that are going to be ever-changing. It's not going to matter um, what the base is. The points and the transformations that I'm going to deal with is still going to produce a graph that's going to be very similar, even if those numbers were different. For instance, same thing even if I had a number 3 here. Um, if it was a 3 or a 13. The graph's going to look different, but I'm just going to try to, but the points that I'm going to provide are going to be what the graph looks like, so it'll give you a general good idea. All right, but before I get into that, I would like to kind of go over the general parent graph for you so we, can, can I, so we can get kind of an idea of what the logarithmic graph looks like. And the best way to do that is to kind of go back to our exponential equation. Let's just do y equals 3 to the x. If you remember when we were graphing the exponential equation, uh, we always crossed at our a, which in this case was 1. And the graph looks something like that, dot, 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 dot. Had a nice little asymptote, right? Well, in my previous video, I talked about exponential logarithmic equations are inverses of each other. That means they can be reflected about the y equals x line. Now, for the graphs that we're going to be uh, working with today is, um, our a is technically always going to be, um, not our a is always going to be 1, but the y-intercept is always going to be at 1. So we're not going to be dealing with any functions where it's going to be different until unless we get to transformations. So the graph of a logarithmic equation is going to look something like this. Okay, so it's basically a direct reflection across what we call the y equals x line, which is this line right here. All right, so there's a couple important characteristics. We have a x-intercept at, uh, at x equals uh, 1. So that coordinate point is 1 comma 0. And we also now have an asymptote. It's a vertical asymptote. So where we originally had a horizontal asymptote, by reflecting over the y equals x line, we now have a vertical asymptote. And that's very important, especially for um, identifying the domain and the range for the graph. So that's kind of like the general idea of what the graph looks like. Um, what I did in exponential, though, is I created a table, which I'd like to kind of do as well. Um, and the main thing is for all of our graphs, until we get to transformations, this is going to be our parent graph. And the only thing really that changes with if you have a number on the outside or if you have a different number in the base, that's gonna, just going to change how the graph increases. Um, you know, it can be really sharp. It can be much more shallow and so forth. But I'm not going to get into details of that because I don't have a graphing calculator, or I mean, I don't have graph paper. Um, and really, the main important thing is I want to produce a graph that's going to be close and similar that you can be able to identify it um, and understand what exactly we did to obtain that. Now, what I'd like to do here real quick, though, is just kind of create a quick little table for um, y equals log base 3 to the x. And if I was going to create a table, because again, a lot of times students get stuck when they're trying to graph. And the main important thing I always want students to go back to is remember, you can always go back and create a table. Now, the important thing is, though, x is. Remember, the logarithmic equation says 3 raised to what power um, gives you x? Well, we want to make sure we're choosing x values that are going to, we want to make sure we're choosing x values that we can take 3 and raise it to. So we know we can raise 3 to 3. We know we could raise 3 to the ninth power. Um, we could also raise 3 to the uh, 1 third power. Okay. So if I was just going to kind of sketch that and kind of see what would happen, here's what would happen. So if I had 3, so if I did, I guess I'll erase this over here. 
So I'd have y equals log base 3 of 3. So log base 3 raised to what power gives you 3? Well, that answer is 1. Uh, if I change that to a 9, 3 raised to what power gives you 9? That answer is 2. If I change this to a 1 third, 3 raised to what power gives you 1 third? This might be a little confusing for you, so sometimes we'll rewrite it in exponential form. Anytime you have a uh, fraction, you can always rewrite that as a negative exponent. So all fractions can be written with a negative as a whole number with a negative power. Therefore, using the one-to-one -one property, which we'll get to later, we know that y equals negative 1. So let's just kind of plot these points and see what the graph looks like. 1, 2, 3. Oh, I also could have taken 3, raised it to the first power, which would have been 0. Right? 3 raised to what power gives you 1? That answer is 0. All right, so we got 3 comma 1. We have 9 comma 2. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We have 1 comma 0. And we have 1 third down negative 1. And what you'll see is no matter how large of or how big of a fraction, I'm always going to get negative 1, but it's going to keep on traveling. It's going to keep on approaching that y-intercept, but it's, or the y-axis, but it's never actually going to crush this. So that's why we call that's going to be our asymptote. So again, the main important thing that I want you guys to understand when we're graphing that, that I'm going to kind of take for granted, is our y-intercepts is going to cross at 1 comma 0. And now all I'm going to do is apply the transformations. OK. so. When we, um, in this case, I have y equals log base 10. So base 10 is going to kind of affect uh, the graph. Oh, and also we're going to talk about domain range. So we know right here uh, my graph is going to cross at 1 comma 0. So I'll just put a nice little point here, 1 comma 0. And what that 3 is going to do, that's also going to vertically stretch the graph. But it's still just crossing at 1 comma 0. I can't get perfect, um, but I just want you to understand there's a 10 there, there's a 3, and what that's basically doing is just vertically kind of stretching the graph. Uh, when we look at our domain, now if you remember exponential functions, I probably should explain this real quick. Exponential function looked like this. The domain for the exponential function was negative infinity to infinity, where the range was 0 to infinity. Well, notice our domain and range here for our logarithmic equation. The domain, it doesn't go any negative numbers. So our domain is from 0 to infinity, whereas our range goes infinitely down and infinitely up. So that's from negative infinity to infinity. And notice, these are inverse functions. Notice how their domain and ranges are basically swapped, right? And that's kind of uh, the power. That's one of the interesting things with uh, uh, inverse functions is that their domains are the opposite are basically swapped. So that's going to be really helpful. Um, a lot of times, if you want to find the domain range, you, you can't figure out what it is for the function. You can always go to the inverse and find the domain range and then swap them to go back. All right, now in this equation, we have a negative. Now, if you remember, whenever we're multiplying a negative outside of a function, that's going to reflect over the x axis. When you're multiplying a function inside, you're going to be reflecting about the y axis. Inside, outside. Inside, outside y-axis, x-axis, y-axis, x-axis, OK? All right, so in this example here, we basically um, we have e, which is going to be our base. So therefore, um, uh, therefore the graph is just going to look somewhat like this. Oops, I should probably do that. Dashed, shouldn't I? OK, it's going to look somewhere like that. Uh, we know it's going to cross at 1 comma 0, and it's going to have the nice asymptote. Well, if I take this graph and reflect it about the x-axis, graph is going to look somewhere like that. By reflecting it, that does not change my vertical asymptote at all, right? I would have to be moving left or right um, for my asymptote to be changed. So the domain in this case is, again, going to be just the same as in my original problem. That's going to be from 0 to infinity. And the range is going to be from negative infinity to infinity. OK, a lot of times students get caught up with the base again. And again, you can use graphing technology. You can create another table. And you can see that this graph is going to have different slopes than this graph. 
right? The multiplying by three on the outside is going to affect the, the parent graph, as well as having a base two is going to affect the parent graph. However, for the problems that we're working on, all of them are still going to cross that to one comma zero. So to kind of understand how those truly differ, my best thing what I do in my class is just use graphing technology so you can see those kind of differences. But they're not going to be dramatically changing the graph. What we're focused on for the changes of the graph is going to be our negatives. Um, however, this 3x, though, does, uh, will affect it, which we'll talk about. OK. Um, bu -bu 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 oh, yeah, OK, that works. No? OK. Um, so in this case, uh, now let's go ahead and graph. Um, again, there's really nothing that's affecting my y-intercept is still going to be uh, 2. And again, if you, if you don't understand why the, y inter why the x-intercept is always 2, again, plug 0 in for y, right? Here, here is the x-axis, here's the y-axis. We want to know what the y-intercept is. So negative log base 2 of x. Well, divide by negative 1. 0 equals log base 2 of x. 2 raised to the, what, to the 0 power equals x. Well, x equals 1. Dang it. OK. Uh, the, y, the y asymptote, or the vertical asymptote, is still going to be the same. Again, we're multiplying by negative on the outside, so that's going to reflect the x-axis. So it's going to look something like this. Nice little vertical asymptote, where now we can say the domain is going to be from 0 to infinity, where the range is going to be from negative infinity to infinity. All right, um, looking over here, I have y equals 1 half ln of x. So whereas the 3 would kind of vertically stretch the graph, the 1 half would kind of compress it um, vertically. So therefore, again, using the same kind of process and idea, I know that this graph, even though it has a base e, is still going to cross, is still going to cross at 1. And again, I can prove that for every single problem just by plugging in 0 in for y and solving. So it's going to look something like this. And the 1 half is just going to kind of stretch or vertically compress it uh, a little bit. But we still have my asymptote here. I can still say my domain is from 0 to infinity. And my range is from negative infinity to infinity. OK. So now we're going to have some changes in our domain range, because now I'm multiplying by an x inside the function, which is going to be reflecting about the y-axis, not just the x. So again, first thing I like to do is just graph the, graph, uh, the function without any transformations. So in this case, um, again, by rewriting this, I know that I'm going to have 1 as my y-intercept. Okay, But if I was going to take this graph and flip it about the y-asymptote uh, or y-intercept, the graph would look something like this. However, even by reflecting it, my, y, my asymptote does not change, right? You're reflecting it about the y-axis, which is where your asymptote is. So that's not going to move. That's not going to change. So my domain for this problem, now the graph is going infinitely to the left. So it's going to be from negative infinity. And it's going to go all the way to the right, but it's not going to cross my asymptote. So it's going to be negative infinity to 0. Whereas my range is still going to be the same. They're both going infinitely down, and they're both increasing infinitely up. So it's going to be negative infinity to infinity. OK. Now the last example, um, this one can be a little tricky, because I basically told you for every single one of these problems, your x-intercept is always equal to 1. And that really is the case. Um, you, I just didn't show the work for each one, because it's redundant. However, for logarithms, we, we got to be a little bit careful. When we have a value that's being multiplied inside of a function, that is going to affect um, our x-intercept. And I'll show you why. Again, do the same thing that I did up here. Replace y in for 0 equals ln of 3 to the x. Rewrite it in exponential form. e to the 0 equals 3 to the x. Divide by 3, 1 third equals x. So now my x-intercept is actually 1 third, not 1. But I have no other reflections or no other changes. So if here's 1, 1 third is going to be like that. So there. It's still going to be approaching 0 as its asymptote and still going to be infinitely to the right and infinitely down. So my domain, is, domain and range are not affected. 
So again, as I remember, if you get confused or kind of forget, always go back to creating a table. Hopefully you also have graphing technology, which you can always double check your answers and so forth. But this is just kind of a basic idea of how to determine domain and range, as well as how to graph your uh, logarithmic equations with, uh, with different bases, uh, coefficients, as well as reflections. Thanks.